This video is sponsored by Squarespace. Hello, I've built a roll-off roof observatory that I'm standing in right now in my backyard here in New Hampshire. And if you're new to the channel, I've been documenting the build process here on YouTube. You can watch the whole series up to this point. There's been four installments, this is the fifth. And it's been a while since the last update video, but I thought my latest project was worthy of one. I just finished the electric in the observatory, so I now have five outlets and two lights all wired up in here, which I am very excited about. Of course, I've been using the observatory on every clear night, but before now to power my all my devices in here, I've been running an extension cord plugged into a power strip. And for lighting, I've just been using a headlamp. Um, so having lights and outlets built into the observatory definitely adds a new level of convenience, but it also has a couple other benefits that I'll talk about in the video. Um, since the last video where I finished the roof, I did paint the outside of the observatory. I didn't film that process because I didn't think it was that interesting to watch paint dry, literally. But the idea uh, with the paint job was just to match the main house, uh, which is red with white trim. I also added these window boxes for flowers, and I got that idea from Skyshed Observatory Plans. So thank you so much to Skyshed for that, because I think that the window boxes is really add a nice touch. The first step in the electric project was to get power to the observatory from the house. And so I contracted help for that uh, because I didn't trust myself to do it right. I wanted a professional electrician to do that. So I had a local master electrician come out and extend my electric service from a panel in the house uh, through a buried conduit in the ground to the observatory where he installed a nice sub panel on the wall for me to work with. And I went with 60 amps for the sub panel, which is plenty for what I have in here right now, but I decided to get more power than I needed at the moment, uh, you know, because I was, I am planning to add more stuff and, you know, just in case in the future I need more power for some reason, it's always better to have more. Before I started any electrical work in the observatory, I did shut off main power to the sub panel from the house. And then I tested that the panel wasn't live with this Klein Tools voltage tester. And if there was power being supplied to the sub panel, this would be beeping. Um, and before I started, I drew out a complete diagram for how I wanted to do the wiring. I'm doing all the wiring with what's called 12-2 Romex, which is just a hot wire, a which is the black, a neutral wire, the white, and a ground wire, which is the bare copper wire. And then it's all wrapped in this sheathing, which makes it more convenient uh, to run around you know, through the walls. And for the interior walls, I'm using regular yellow Romex. And for the part that goes under the observatory, for the piers, I'm using gray, ground contact Romex. For running the wires through the walls, the way I'm doing that is I just drill out one inch holes through the studs using a Forstner bit on my drill here. And I did the holes for the wire about 20 inches up from the floor. With the holes all drilled out, the next step was to nail in all the electrical boxes for the light fixtures, the light switches, and the outlets. And with all of those boxes nailed into place, I could now rough in my electrical wiring. And I'm leaving plenty of extra wire sticking out of each box, and I'm also hammering in these insulated staples to keep the Romex tidy when it needs to run up or down the walls uh, to the various electrical boxes. On the south and north walls, I'm uh, putting the outlets at the standard height, which I think is uh, 16 inches up from the floor. For the west wall, I'm instead putting the box up towards the top of the wall, which I'll explain at the end of the video what my rationale is there. And then I'm wiring everything in, starting with the lights. I won't bore you with the minutia of how to wire each fixture because it's likely that your observatory will be different than mine. But I can say the products that I found easiest 
to work with as a DIYer were Wago wire nuts for splitting and connecting wires and Leviton Decora edge switches and outlets because instead of having to make the little wire hooks and secure those with a screw, uh, you can just strip the end of the wire, put it in the right hole and lock it with the lever on the side. So I really like these Decora edge products. For the covers, since the observatory roof will be open, as it is right now, uh, for a lot of the time, any clear night where I'm out here, I went with these expandable in-use outdoor covers that allow you to plug stuff in while protecting it all from moisture. It's basically like a weatherproof box. Okay, and the last thing to mention here, again, since the observatory is sort of an outdoor space, I am protecting the whole circuit by using a GFCI outlet and running the power that continues um, on the circuit off the load terminals on the GFC outlet. And my understanding of what that means is that there, if there is a ground fault anywhere on the circuit, uh, that will trip this uh, GFCI outlet and protect everything. Uh, after I connected the first circuit to the breaker, it's a 20 amp breaker on the sub panel and turned on the power from the house, I did test the GFC outlet with an outlet tester from Klein Tools again, just to make sure it was working as designed. And it seemed to be, it very quickly tripped uh, the circuit interrupter, which is what you want. Okay, and the moment of truth was flipping on the lights. And yes, you can see they did work. And you can see that I didn't have the cover on the switches quite yet because I wanted to make sure everything was working uh, before I finalized everything. I decided to go with Philips Hue LED RGB bulbs because I already had those in the house and it, what they allow me to do is control uh, the bulbs from the Wiz, W-I-Z app on my phone. So I have it set up for the first switch to be a red light and the second switch to be a white light. But if I need to lower the intensity of either bulb, that's very easy to do with the app. It's like basically like a dimmer on your phone. You can also change the color of either bulb at any time with the app. Now with the first circuit completed, I turned back off all the power to the observatory using the breaker in the house and worked on the second circuit, which goes underneath the observatory. Um, and the purpose of this one is to put an outlet at each pier for all the devices that go with the telescope pier. Now, originally I planned to put these outlets flush with the floor of the observatory, but I got a lot of feedback when I mentioned that in a previous video, that it'd be a bad idea because of moisture, which made sense. So I've decided to go vertical and use these waterproof boxes. So everything should be good there. Now, when I was making the floor, I put in some holes, uh, drilled some holes just like in the walls. Um, and I put in plastic, this plastic ribbed tubing through those holes, through the floor joist to make this whole process easier. But <laughs> I found trying to get this gray Romex to go through this ribbed plastic tubing that I had was just impossible. <laughs> the Romex just seems too stiff and I don't know, I, I couldn't get it to work. None of the normal tricks like using a vacuum worked for me. So I got frustrated enough that I just ripped out all the blue tubing and instead, because this type of Romex, the gray stuff is designed to be outdoors, I decided just to run it bare straight through the holes in the joists and um, I did that by crawling under the observatory and this is where having plenty of space under my observatory came in really handy because I can actually fit under there and, and run the wire through the holes no problem. To support the electrical boxes at each pier, I decided to add a piece of pegboard that I'm attaching to the floor pieces with some brackets that I had on hand. And then I'm cutting out a piece of the pegboard for the outlet to come through. And then on the floor part, I'm drilling two holes in this first pier for the PVC conduit. Uh, one for the wire that's coming in from the sub panel from the source and one for the wire that's going out to the second pier. And that works well with this metal box because it already had these uh, special uh, threaded holes. And then I just bought the correct threaded adapters, which are half inch. Um, so I'm connecting at the bottom of the box and at the back of the box. And for the back of the box, I bought this curved piece to sort of push that uh, conduit away. And this is how it all looks finished. Um, my thought for now is just to put the power strip and the AC adapters and other wiring 
in between the pier, the concrete pier and the pegboard to give it a nice clean look as you come into the observatory. But I may change my mind on that and start zip tying stuff to the front of the pegboard uh, if it's more functional. I, I like that this whole setup that I've designed is sort of flexible as I try stuff out and see how I wanna organize things at each pier. So what is the big advantage of doing this electrical work? It, it did cost a fair amount of money. Uh, part of the reason this video is taking me so long is because I saved up to do all the electrical work in the observatory. I mean, before the extension cord was obviously working just fine, but um, as I mentioned, there is a convenience factor because I don't like leaving the extension cord out in the snow or even in the summer because I'm often mowing the lawn. Um, so you know, with extension cord, you're often reeling it back up and putting it back out. But another thing is I've put off adding certain devices to the observatory until I had permanent power because it just didn't really make sense to wire them up every single time off the extension cable. But now that I have permanent outlets, uh, the first thing that I've added here are some security cameras. And I got two of these for now. These are the Wise V4 models. They work over Wi-Fi and an app, of course, um, but they can also record continuously to a micro SD card. So I got pretty high end 256 gigabyte pro endurance cards, one for each camera. Um, these cards were almost as expensive as the cameras themselves, but I figure if you know I do have a break in or something, having a reliable card in there that's capturing clear footage of the break in from multiple angles is gonna be really important. And I know I've heard that um, when you're just recording continuously 24 hours a day, uh, that the SD card really should be that endurance style card. And what I like about these WISE cameras is uh, they're very easy to set up, but then they have all kinds of settings that you can manipulate in the app. So I can tell them not to use any lights, no infrared light, no status light, no spotlight, which is a white light. And so I can turn off all the lights when I'm imaging, because of course you don't want any lights to come on. Even IR light, which we can't really see, the cameras can see and it can cause issues. So you want all lights off. Um, you can see what it looks like here. If there's moonlight, there's plenty of light actually with all the lights off on the camera just to, to still pick up uh, good uh, footage. If it's really dark um, with no moonlight, it doesn't really pick up stuff that well. <laughs> um, but in that case, I would be here. If, if it was a dark night and the roof was open, I'd be here. So I'm not too uh, worried about that. And then when I'm not here, when I'm not actually doing astrophotography, uh, when I'm out of town, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna turn all of those lights back on. And the spotlight is especially cool um, because it's super bright and you can put it on so that when the app uh, or the camera detects motion, um, it will immediately sort of put on this really bright spotlight um, and also uh, start taking pictures of any motion detection and give me an alert on my phone telling me it's detected motion. Um, and so then I could immediately call my house sitter and be like, is there someone out there or something? Um, so I, I'm thinking this is gonna be a good system for me. And it uh, takes these snapshots, these motion detection snapshots with timestamps um, for any motion detection. So then I could go back to the continuous video recording and pull out full video recording too. And you can do all of this without the subscription. Now there is a monthly subscription that gives you more options, but I figure I don't need it because with just the options that are included for free, I have, I have plenty. Oh, and I wanted to mention the reason I put that outlet up high instead of down um, low like the other outlets is one, because of the camera, it being uh, closer to the top here, and then the other reason is I think it's likely that I'll eventually motorize the roof. And right now my top contender for that is the Dark Dragon's complete roll-off system. And looking at their photos online, they have an outlet situated near the motor like this. So I thought I might as well set it up in case I get that system um, for it to work that way. So to be clear, I'm not really in a rush to motorize the roof. I don't think I'm gonna do it maybe even this year because I only plan to use the observatory when I'm home. Uh, so it's really not been a problem at all for me to manually roll the roof off at the beginning of the night and on 
back on in the morning. Um, the counter argument to that is if I get a motorized roof and a weather station and a rain sensor and a cloud sensor, a bunch of tech and get that all working, I could then go to sleep and let that automated system close the roof if it senses clouds or rain. And I'm definitely gonna consider that, but so far I enjoy being out here so much that it really is just not a top concern of mine to automate uh, the roof yet. So that's about all I have to share for part five of this series. I have some ideas of what I want to do next, probably involving computing and tech, um, because right now, I am still running things off my trusty Lenovo laptop, but I'd like to add a mini PC at each pier and clean up a lot of the cabling. And then another thing I'd like to add is an all sky camera. I think I've seen that on other observatories. I think that's a really cool project to do to get the, you know, the weatherproof dome and the little Raspberry Pi and the ASI camera and put it all together. And then you can get sort of continuous monitoring of your sky every night. Um, and now that I have permanent power, that should make that a lot easier. To wrap up, this video is sponsored by Squarespace. If you need a website, Squarespace has you covered. I use Squarespace for nicocarver.com because they make it easy to create something professional, but personalized with design intelligence, which combines Squarespace's years of expertise in design with cutting edge AI technology to allow you to design the perfect website for your needs. And if you have a business and you're trying to sell something, Squarespace has all kinds of features built in from selling products to courses to just about anything online. And your customers can pay however works for them thanks to flexible payments, including Klarna, Apple Pay, and Afterpay. So if this sounds intriguing, you can get started with Squarespace today with a free trial by heading to squarespace.com slash Nebula Photos. And when ready to make a purchase of hosting or a domain, you can get 10% off with code Nebula Photos at checkout. Till next time, this has been Nico Carver. Clear skies, everyone.